Last question before we get started, which we'll then have more questions. C can you hear my amplified voice right now? Okay, cool. So, welcome to the What Stability Means and How to Do Better talk. So, before we get started, I just want to do a quick poll. How many people in here are package maintainers in Fedora? Okay. And how many people in here work upstream on those packages? Okay. So some, but not all. All right, cool. So I think we've got the right, the right uh, level for, for today. Uh, some of you are going to be very bored by this, but hopefully you can take it and make it better. So just first thing on the list, uh, this is Quirk, and he wants to start a revolution, but he didn't print enough flyers. And I, too, want to start a revolution, but I did not prepare enough slides. And what I want to say is that stability is an open source community problem in general. This isn't just Fedora, but inside Fedora, we do have some things that we have created that help us be more stable than your average upstream, and we should take advantage of them. So with that, let's talk about what stability is, because stability fundamentally comes down to your frame of reference. Like the gyroscope, when it's spinning, can glide along a string and not fall over. Uh, but I wouldn't call it stable because I know it's going to slow down and fall down. So stability in, in a Linux distribution fundamentally is changes for the better because you know any system can can be resilient. It can run fine. It will crash. It will corrupt data. But the thing that is different, the thing that is underattended are the other forms of stability. So we're going to cover four of them. There is, of course, crashes and corruption. But what really makes things unstable is what we do as developers to the software when we push out updates, when we make changes. So that comes down to kind of three major categories. The first one is developer ISP stability. If you maintain a library, like a shared library, a static library, anything that other people are relying on, and you make an update to it, if that update is incompatible, then applications that are already built can, can crash. And if you want to rebuild them, sometimes they don't rebuild. Uh, there's also kind of provision and management stability, where, say, you're making a Linux distribution, and the, you introduce changes into that distribution that cause it to no longer, say, install or update or change. And then finally, there's operational stability. And this is, this is like the big one that we all get wrong all the time because we choose perfection of execution over uh, like continuity of, of expectation. So let's just cover these in a little more detail one by one. So crashes and corruption. What's the problem? It's 2019. <laughs> these are still a thing. Uh, like, why is that? <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a lot of reasons for it, and the fact is the solutions are really well known, and, and all you have to do is, is do them, and it'll be fine. You can stop this just by like applying the best practices that are well documented throughout the industry. Um, my favorite, just as a starting point, though, is turning on warnings and then fixing them. That goes a really long way, but um, for, for like deep details on how to solve all of your your package crashes, your data corruptors and whatnot, there are a thousand talks, there are 10,000 tools, there are all sorts of things, and all you have to do is use them. Uh, but that's not really the thrust of this, because everybody knows, yeah, we shouldn't crash, and if you get a bug report that it crashes, it's the kind of thing you pay attention to, and you're like, yeah, that's definitely wrong. That I did not mean for that program to crash. I didn't mean to lose your data. I'm going to try fixing that. We don't actually have a problem with this other than the fact that it, it still happens. But when it does happen, then we pay attention. So <laughs> where do we not pay attention? It's, it's in these other cases. It's like developer ISV stability. If I do an update on my system, I'm a developer, I write an application, I want to ship that application, I generally expect that that application is going to continue to run on the systems that people deploy it on. Even if they do a software update, if they update their operating system, even if I'm not part of their operating system, even if I'm not part of the infrastructure that does, uh, that does the update, I expect before the update and after the update for my application to continue running. And what actually happens? Sometimes library updates break binaries that are, uh, until they're recompiled. In other cases, updates 
to that same library mean that you can't recompile them because you broke the API. So this is basically API ABI breakage, and it is it's one of the things we do in RHEL to that that actually causes people to use RHEL, even though it doesn't have all of the awesome features of Fedora, just because the value of this sort of stability is greater than the value of the novelty that Fedora provides. So there are things that you can do. There are solutions to this that anybody who is a developer or anybody who is a maintainer can manage. The first is, if you're upstream and you update the library, if you're gonna break the ABI or API, update the version number. Dead simple stuff, right? And oftentimes this doesn't happen. And um, also, if you happen to be a maintainer, don't assume that your upstream has actually done this. Frequently, they'll just go ahead and break ABI or API without bumping the version number. But we have tools that detect even this. Uh, my favorite is ABI diff, which is part of libabigail, which is in Fedora and does a phenomenal job. And then finally, if you are a package maintainer and there is ABI breakage, consider packaging the new package independent of the old package. Use name versioning so that people don't have to go forward. I mean, one of the great functions of Fedora is that it causes us to kind of take all of the packages that are inside Fedora and move them to the latest version. But for anything outside of Fedora, like Steam or Chrome or many other things that haven't like gotten into the Fedora universe that aren't part of like the Koji infrastructure, those things can't benefit if we force them to move. Like, so if we want greater adoption outside of the Fedora sphere, then actually providing compatibility libraries for older versions is actually a really useful thing. And if you do that, please set them up for parallel installation so you can have more than one available at a time. Best practices for this are really well documented. So just any questions on this, comments? I want to time box everything to four or five minutes. Well, the way I would do it is put it in the main repository. I would not use modules for this right now, unless I had to, but I would also defer to like modularity leads on that topic. This is something that there's some guidance on in Fedora, but the packaging guidelines are a little bit fuzzy, actually. Yeah, it's in user bin, user bin ABI diff, and it's got a man page, and it's very comprehensive. I mean, like any GNU tool, it, it's deeply detailed, and it only scratches the surface. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say as if you start using it, you don't find the answers. Well, post to Fedora Devel, we have the team that built it inside Red Hat, and it's the kind of thing we want to grow the use of. Because the more people do ABI compatibility, the easier our job is mm -hmm. to get make the next version of RHEL come out and have it be just as, as compatible as the previous one. So, you know, if I had my way, like all future rel releases would have all old rel releases libraries in them, and you could install them side by side if you needed to, because that would actually provide genuine value to people as long as we're like doing security updates. All right, so let's let's move on. Provision and management. So this is this is like a really straightforward one. How many like have you ever used Anaconda Kickstarts? Yeah. Do you have to change them every time you go to a new Fedora release, like beyond updating a path name? No, no, of course not, because breaking something so fundamental would be a bad idea. Uh, and, and yet there is, there is often a push to do this, and we often have to push back. And sometimes there's good reasons why you'd want to, but the, the basic problem is that 
when distributions are over 25 years old, we have really strongly established provisioning and updating mechanisms. We have management tools that expect them to remain the same. And so anytime we actually want to make a change to one of the fundamentals, what we're actually saying is everybody who's ever tried to write software that depends on the ability to install our software has to go back and update their software to match. And so this is a problem for like the virtualization team. It's a problem for any of the the companies that have their own management solutions. It's a problem for OpenStack. It's a problem for OpenShift, Kubernetes, just anything that provisions. And likewise, uh, if, if you're in some sort of configuration management, you use Ansible, you use CF Engine, you use Chef, like the ability to actually get into the system and connect and, and do updates, if you change one of those fundamentals, then you've kind of broken provision and management, and that's really bad from an ops perspective. And that just makes people less likely to trust the distribution to, to take the time. If setting it up one time for Fedora, setting it up one time for a distro is easy if you can trust it forevermore. If you have to keep updating every six months, it erodes trust and it, it just makes you disinclined to go there. And so the more trust we build, the more likely people are to join in. And that's really what we want to do is just kind of grow community, grow, uh, grow the ecosystem. So the the basic solution for this one is don't break the old thing, make a new thing. Like we have uh, Fedora Core OS, it's a different provisioning model, but they didn't go back and like destroy server, they just made a new thing and it's got its own way of deploying and it's, it's good, it's effective and it didn't harm anything, it's just another take on, on how to do it. And of course, just following the Fedora packaging guidelines is, is good advice no matter what because all of these things have been contemplated by uh, the, the greatest minds of Fedora and they know all of those evil corner cases. And as, as we invent new things, the guidelines are updated. And it, just, it generally works out pretty well. So here is, here's the big one that I think bites us the most, the hardest, is just operational stability. And this is, this is really straightforward. Like, here's the problem. We, we have muscle memory. We have commands. Uh, and they get broken by behavioral changes and packages. Like, does anybody think that the git command line options are in any way intuitive? Like, it's, it's confusing, and you can very easily look at it and say, in the clarity of hindsight, if we just remapped all of these things to these letters and these words, then we would have things that make a lot more sense. But it would also break everything that has come before, and then as time goes on, those things wouldn't make sense either. So at some point, we have to realize that the getting to the perfect set of features or the perfect configuration or the perfect interaction is actually worse than providing continuity of what's already there. And this is, this is something that it's not obvious, right? When, when we, <laughs> it's, we've all done it. <laughs> we've all done it. I'm not blaming anybody. It makes, it, it is clear that we can always improve, but how we value improvement if you look at it not just from what makes sense in the moment and the clarity of hindsight is different than what makes sense if you are somebody that wasn't deeply involved if you just rely on this thing. And so the, the example that I have for RHEL 8 is that uh, RHEL 7 had YUM and, and then DNF happened and DNF came out with an explicit goal of being incompatible. And there are some good reasons for this, right? Like incompatibility was, or the, the force of compatibility was kind of crippling to uh, innovation. I mean, there were a lot of dynamics in play, but basically a lot of good things people wanted to do and being constrained by compatibility was a problem initially. But we actually spent two and a half years after DNF was rolled out just trying to make it more compatible with YUM. And it's not 100% and perhaps some compromises were made the wrong way, but basically that compatibility matters so much more to our, our customers in RHEL and, and our product managers who are seeking new customers that that reversion was worth it. So what are the actual solutions? If you have power in the upstream, make behavioral changes runtime configurable. So basically, like, if you, if you wanna change the like, key bindings, for instance, put it in a config file. And, and make sane defaults and, and just otherwise make it so that you can have the thing that is technically correct to you, but also the thing that is uh, known to others to work and then make that an option. It'll help you move over time. 
and it will let them get the benefit of the changes that you've made when they're ready for them without uh, causing them to, to try it out, say, oh, it doesn't work right, and then not even use it at all. And then if you happen to be a maintainer and you want to maybe put in a new application that is incompatible with an old application, put it in as another module stream because then you can give that same ability. You can be, you can say, there's this version and there's this version. The new version is kind of incompatible, but it's really worthwhile. And then the person who's actually going to use this stuff gets, gets to decide. And this is like one of the fundamental cool things that modules give us is just the ability to provide new features and the ability to provide legacy support without having to compromise on either. So when you get right down to it, stability is the continuity of experience over time. And we don't want software to stand still. The, all the cool stuff that happens in Fedora, we definitely want that to keep on happening. All the stuff that happens upstream, it's great. But if we make just a few small changes along these lines, if you make those changes opt in, you get a better customer experience, you get more people that can actually trust in open source and, and deploy it and trust in Fedora and deploy it and use that as their basis. And I think that's what we all want is for Fedora to get bigger and, and address more use cases, that, like do the things that we wished it could do, but, but for somebody not being willing to. And that's actually the whole thing. So more questions, more comments, and would anybody like to maybe take this talk of turn it into their own and like give it at FOSDEM or, you know, kind of like spread the word of, you know, what you think compatibility is? Because I think that's the kind of thing we need is to just like grow this as a mindset inside the community. You're, uh, you're in the revolution now. Yeah. I've also been involved. I just found out I was drafted to giving what we call a lunch and learn, which is where we present this to the engineering people and the company provides lunch for people. But they can <coughs> tell me about So I have a captive audience. Nice. All right. So different question for you all then. Is there something else that you think, oh, this is stability. This is what it's about that, that wasn't even close to covered in this? Like, is there some fifth thing? Steven. Predictable releases uh, allows people to make, uh, to make uh, reasonable decisions about when to, uh, to accept change. Mm -hmm. And that's something uh, that uh, most upstream are terrible at. That's true. Like the, the most mature distribution uh, communities have like their, their annual release or their quarterly release or something, but it is, it does seem pretty chaotic. Well, yeah, distributions do, but like GCC, you know it's going to come out every once a year, glibc, and, and, and things that, like, components that have been around for, for long enough that they can rent cars and not have to pay extra in the U.S. It's, <laughs> those, those ones have, have kind of gone through this pain, but we don't want every component we ship to have to be, like, a quarter of a century old before we're willing to, uh, like, take the lessons of the past, right? So... Definitely predictable cadence for any community is, a, is an outstanding thing. That, that's a great suggestion. All right, anybody else? Other thing you think, man, I can't believe you didn't cover this. All right, do anybody want advice on how to like stop your packages from crashing and burning? Like, if anyone came in with that, we could definitely like have a discussion. All right, so few people raised their hands for maintainer, like you're a package maintainer in Fedora. Uh, do you think you would do any of these things? Would you, would you modularize? Would you version number your libraries? I'd probably do the latter. I don't know if I want to do the former. Yeah, I do all of those things that you just talked about. Yeah. But I'm also the upstream, uh, I'm also the exclusive upstream for most of the package I maintain, so. Right. Doing those kinds of things to make people more happy about stuff 
it's not a new concept to me, but it wasn't something that I saw was something we could do within the, within the context of Fedora, because it didn't seem like it fit all that well for Fedora. Yeah, if you, if you see Fedora as simply being the place where the latest upstreams get together and, and have a good time every six months, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily fit. But when you start, when, when people want to take Fedora a little bit further, if, they, if you want to have Fedora CoreOS and Fedora IoT, if you actually want to deploy it, not just because you're developing operating system, but because you want to use the result for some purpose, these things start to make a little bit of sense, even in the Fedora context. And indeed, this is something we could get ahead of by, by having this be a standard inside the community. Yeah. So the question is, can it be done in such a way that for, for all the volunteers that are doing this packaging, it's not really a, a great hardship to them? Yeah. A topic for for. Just let's assume that they need to be parallel installable. 
because that might that makes it easier um, for all the weird cases that wind up coming up when we have to handle transitions. I don't know. That, that's why I'm just asking. Yeah. I, Especially I'm, not sure, I'm not sure that. So in any case, we should probably start the discussion and just kind of see where we're at now. So this was 25 minutes. Thank you for joining. And um, come talk to me afterward if this is something that kind of spoke to you. Thanks, all.